Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's Jane Van Foren Rogers. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just um, give a few minutes just for people to um, hop online. We'll kind of see, um, see how this goes. Um, I am here today with Karen Kramer, um, who is a friend of mine. She is a fellow um, member of Igniting Souls Tribe and Author Academy Elite with Carrie Oberbrunner. And um, I actually met Karen last year at um, the Igniting Souls Conference in October and um, really, you know, hit it off with her there. And I was so thankful to be able to connect with her. I felt like we uh, shared a lot of good perspectives on some things. And um, while I was not fortunate enough to be able to um, edit her, her book, Honor Your Health, um, I definitely wanted to um, give her an opportunity today um, to talk about the book and um, share sort of, you know, what inspired that, um, some of the um, some of the things going on there. So um, let me just start um, with a quick, quick introduction of Karen and, and we'll kind of get into things. So um, Karen Kramer is an author, um, holistic health coach and speaker. Um, she helps women who are overwhelmed, uninspired and stuck to understand that it's time to take back their power and so they can start writing their own story. Um, at a young age, um, actually always, um, Karen says that she's been interested in um, understanding how people heal. And um, she had several incidences. Um, she says her father was hit by a car when she was four years old. And even though his life was saved, he became a lifelong patient. And that had a big impact on her. Um, he actually died of cancer um, when he was only 60 years old. Um, Karen's mother also um, died early in life, um, and um, Karen, as a result, you know, decided to become a registered nurse um, to try to um, understand healing and, and sort of get on the inside of, you know, those, those medical um, situations. So um, she kind of discovered that um, the traditional medical model is often more interested in you know, not necessarily in healing, more in kind of keeping people sick. And so she wanted to explore some different ways to approach um, health issues. And um, so, yeah, I think I'll just, I think I'll just let Karen, I'll let you take over and just kind of tell us a bit more about yourself. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's ironic actually that I became a nurse because my father, as a result of what he went through, hated hospitals. <laughs> And I internalized that and I hated them too. And I may be the only nurse you know that has never worked in a hospital, um, apart of course from my clinicals in school. But what was happening with my, my dad and later on with my mother was that I, you know, I, they were being good patients. And now I, I think of them as sheep, okay? Because we follow the rules, go to our routine physicals. If, if we don't feel good, we go to the doctor. Here, take this prescription. <laughs> Here, have this procedure, have this test. And you kind of get sucked onto that conveyor belt. Um, and, you know, med medicine today is really big business and it's for profit. And so what happens is that there's kind of an underlying agenda there because if you get well, they lose their customer, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, um, you know, a lot of the treatments and medicines and things that we're offered come with their own very real risks and in the form of side effects and unknown effects. And I found over and over people don't know, in some cases don't even know they should ask questions um, and if they do think of that, they're not sure what to ask. And medical terminology is like, you know, a foreign language. So uh, people can be hesitant to say to a doctor, you know, wait a minute, I never heard that word before. You know, I don't know what that means. Could you spell it? And I coach people and tell them to stop. Ask them how to spell it because you're going to do hopefully your own investigation of whatever it is that's being proposed to you. Um, so anyway, it was occurring to me, just as, as I went through my own stages of life, things would happen to me, and I would go to the doctor, and I would 
in many cases not be any better and in some cases be worse off. And so I started thinking, um, particularly after what happened with my mother, you know, what if there was another way? Absolutely. What if there is? Once you ask the question, opportunities and things begin to show up that you notice that you didn't see before because you know you weren't looking or you just never even thought that there was an alternative to chemo for example and your doctor sure didn't tell you <laughs> most likely um right. and so just to use that example to stay with that example so um so with my mother she actually she died at the age that i was when i wrote the book um so i am now a year out living longer than she did and I started thinking as that 55 birthday, 55th birthday approach that, you know, she never got a chance to live after that age. And, you know, wow, it was so profound. Like, what, what can I do, you know, kind of with the all these extra years that I hope that I presume that I have um, to kind of maybe help other people in the same situation know that there are other options, feel empowered to even make those un, often unpopular choices. Because I'll tell you, if you decide you don't want chemo and your family doesn't agree with that, it's a lonely place to be. I mean, it really is. Yeah. So, um, so, so I started thinking about that and I decided that I would write a book and I would tell the stories of what happened to me and and others what their um, outcomes were and and try to help people see that they can take their power back with their health. <laughs> there are some ways to do that, um, yeah. to feel empowered and you know to know that really their their healthcare providers are, the, are their partners. They're not the boss of them. <laughs> right? I mean, they don't, you know you, okay? They know what they've learned, which in many cases is really just, just treating the physical body. And we're so much more than that. And so, you know, holistic healing, what I love about holistic, holistic healing is it, it really does encompass everything, body, mind, and spirit. It's not just what's going on with you physically, because often, quite often, it has its roots in other things well and i, I do, I do sense sometimes <laughs> that um sorry i'm getting, I'm getting echo here for me i can turn my volume down uh, are you getting an echo on your end no i don't hear it all right so i i do get the sense sometimes that um i think as you say in the book and using your your mother as an example that i think there's often the perception that like you say when you're when you're diagnosed with something as serious as cancer that a lot of times people immediately go to that traditional therapy with chemotherapy and they there's the perception that if you don't embrace that traditional medical model that you're not fighting i think you kind of make that point in your book and so how is that how can people overcome that that when they decide to maybe try alternative therapies whether that's you know nutrition acupuncture you know some of the things that you mentioned in the book reiki um, yoga, how can people sort of set their family's mind at ease that it's like, no, I am fighting this. I'm just fighting it in a different way. Well, maybe, maybe they can, and maybe they can't bring their family on board. And, you know, so often I'll just say, you know, we, as women, we're so busy taking care of everyone else that we're always an afterthought, even for ourselves, we're an afterthought. And yeah. when you get a diagnosis like that, um, boy, that is a sign that something in your life has to change, it really is. And if you, in, in my opinion, <laughs> it really, really sure. is, because everything you've done up to this point, um, you know, you're finding yourself where you are now, and if you continue, I mean, it only makes sense it only makes sense if you continue doing everything you've been doing, you're going to continue to get what you're getting. And if you don't want that, then you may have to make an unpopular decision that is unsupported by your, your family and maybe your friends. But what you'll do is 
you'll begin to form a new community. And hopefully those people that mean so much to you will, will become part of your new community. Um, but if not, um, your life is at stake in many cases. You know, your life is at stake. Are you going to take back your power, value yourself enough to say, you know, this is what I have to do because I want to get well. And so, um, so with, with cancer, again, we're still talking about that just to keep using the same example. If that were to happen to me, uh, what I would do is take a giant step back from the, uh, the typical sort of treatment that will be recommended. And in some cases, very fast, you know, appointments start getting made for you, maybe even before you realize that you even consented to anything. Yeah. Um, take a job. I, I love, I, if I can just interject for one second, I love how you make that point in the book too, with your mom, how once she was diagnosed, there was no question. She was not even asked the question of, hey, is this, you know, this is what we would recommend. Is this the line of treatment you would like to pursue? It was more like, so you're going to have, you know, 13 chemo treatments and they start on this date and. Yeah. Or you have to have chemo. And you'll hear people say that a lot. I have to have chemo or I have to have radiation. Or I have to have the surgery. Or the doctor told me if I were his mother, I would do this. Um, that's great, but you're not. <laughs> you know, you're, you're you and you get to decide what's best for you. And I think it makes it makes really good sense if you have a situation, if you have a health condition, um, which hopefully, you know, so often maybe you yourself have been misdiagnosed or no, you probably know someone who has been misdiagnosed. So yeah. question everything if it doesn't feel right to you, if it doesn't feel true. Um, but if you're dealing with a health condition, it makes sense to me to kind of look around for people who've had that too, that have healed from it and do what they did <laughs> or see what they did and then adapt, make your own plan, adapt it to what feels right for you and start doing that. Um, the thing with chemo is uh, it doesn't, you know, in, there aren't really many types of cancer that chemo really cures. So mm. um, if you if you think about what your goals are, maybe your goals are to live as long a life as you can, to feel as good as you can, to be able to do all the things you like to do. Um, really think about what's important to you and then use that as a filter to focus your decision making. Because if you want to feel as well as you can, as long as you can, and this treatment is going to make you sick as a dog and wish you were dead, <laughs> and give you potentially a whole bunch of new health issues that you didn't have before, um, does that really align with, with your vision for your life? Well, and I, I think we've all kind of, you know, been in those situations where someone receives the diagnosis and again, I, I think sometimes that perception is, well, of course you're gonna do what, of course you're gonna do chemo, of course you're gonna fight this, and of course you're gonna whatever. And so do you think that in some cases people need to try to, again, maybe set up a bit of a boundary there to say almost, again, take back that power and claim their own life and say, you know, I respect what you're saying and I understand you know, why you would suggest these things, of course, However, you know, there are alternatives that I'd like to explore and it is my life. And, and some the other part I was going with that is I think we've all known someone for whom chemo didn't work. And like you say, that when they once they started that, it's almost like, you know, it does. It makes you weaker and sicker and takes down your immunity. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're injecting your body with poison. <laughs> and so even yeah. though, yes, that's the traditional medical model. I guess I'm just trying to get at if you if you have any suggestions as far as sort of, again, just maybe setting up those boundaries or having that maybe kind of caring conversation with your family to say, you know. Well, I think so. I'll I'll go back to um, the situation with my mother. And so I have there were four of us, five, my dad and four children. And one of us supported her decision to stop and three did not, and one was neutral. 
Mm -hmm. And so that was actually the opposite of when she started. They all said, you know, you got to do it. And you got, and I really do think that she let them influence her decision making. So mm -hmm. when she did finally, you know, halfway through say, you know, I'm done, I'm not doing this. Um, people were irritated with her, mad with her, upset with her. Um, but I will say just in the, my own example from my, my own life that they did settle down and then after a period of time supported her in her in, on her path okay with what she wanted to do so um and there's uh, i talk about him a lot chris wark w-a-r-k and chris beat cancer and he talks about that um as well that you know at first no one in his family was on board with him no one mm -hmm. including his wife wow. and, and again what a lonely place to be if you're going to start juicing and you know whatever it is that you've decided is is what you need to do um and nobody is with you sure so, so what happened what happens over time again is is either people will fall in line with you because they realize that you really are more important to them than their opinion about what you should do <laughs> or yeah. and and or you're creating a new community of people around you that do get it and do support your your right to decide what's best for yourself health wise and that can be family that can be health practitioners practitioners it can be friends yeah but i think it'll be different in every case so and 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 there are plenty so that said i'm sure there are plenty of people that aren't willing to stand up to their loved ones that way and so it almost becomes the easier road to just get on the conveyor belt right and just do what everyone tells you to do and path, and path of least way. resistance yeah and that you know what and and for some people maybe that is what they're supposed to do you know i don't know you've been through plenty of trials in your life jane i'm sure <laughs> as have i and a lot of times when it's happening you're like you know why is this happening <laughs> like why am i going through this and then years later you know, you do find the meaning in, in that suffering and you do understand why you had to go through it, you know, and, and often it's you help someone else. Would you mind just quickly kind of um, encapsulating your mom's story for us? Can we back up and you just tell us a bit about what happened to your mom? Because I think that's, for me, that was the most emotional and heart-rending example in your book and it made it so personal to understand why you have chosen to do what you do, you know, both in going into registered nursing and all the things that you've pursued since then. Well, I actually was a nurse early on at the beginning when she was um, first getting into it, very new nursing was um, a second career for me that I started in my thirties. Um, but anyway, so my mother, she was faithful. She kept her annual doctor appointments and, you know, she went every year and she had her, her um, physicals. And then around, around the time she was 50 or so, she started to not feel right. And it was, it, you know, it was subtle in the beginning, but, um, you know, she'd go to the doctor, she had a male doctor. And, and first he was just telling her it's menopause. Um, don't worry about it. You know, you're having these symptoms. It's because of that here. Take this Premarin. And Premarin is a hormone that was pretty commonly dis um, dispensed to women. Uh, at one point, it was like the most prescribed drug for women. I don't, yeah. I don't know the statistics. I don't know if that's still true. Yeah. But in, in her case, I'm convinced that that is what fueled her cancer and made it so aggressive and made it so deadly so fast is I'm sure that I, I feel certain that, that the hormone played a role in that. Sure. But anyway, so she's taking Cameron, she's still not feeling well. She goes back to the doctor. She was having a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, and they, he said he decided it was her gallbladder. So, well, let's take out your gallbladder and then you know that you'll be fine. So she has a surgery and again, it, I don't ever remember her thinking, should I do this? Or is this really, you know, does this make sense? Or does this feel like the right thing to me? And, you know, it was it was decades ago. It was like 25 years ago. Um, 
but I'll say I don't see medicines change very much since then in terms of how we're treated. It really hasn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so she has the surgery. She doesn't feel good after, and 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 he says, well, you know, you got to give it time. <laughs> you got to give it more time. So, like years have gone by by now. Oh wow. So. I mean, it got to the point where her gastrointestinal symptoms were so bad, she was afraid to go out. And, you know, that was that was a big wake up call for me. And, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, we're busy living our lives. And um, but I'm like, what's going on with you? Mom? And she's and she's afraid to leave the house because she's having such bad symptoms. Then. Yeah, because, you know, oh, I, what if I urgently need a bathroom and there isn't one where I am? So yeah, I just stay home. That's a very real concern. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. And, you know, lots of people with different conditions can relate to that, I'm sure. And um, But for yeah. me, this was, you know, she's getting sicker and sicker. The more treatments she's receiving, the worse things are getting for her, the less able she is to go about her daily life, which, you know, that seems like a small request to just be able to go about your daily life, right? Right. Um, so then I think this is where like God or the universe um, intervened. So she was feeling really unwell again and wanted to see the doctor. He was off, but his female associate, his female partner was, was on that day who actually happened to be my doctor. And so she, she saw her instead and it was much different. And she said, well, let's see what's going on. Like they had not done any imaging testing, They're like nothing, just go home, <laughs> you know, it'll be okay. Wow. So they decided to do exploratory laparotomy and it happened pretty fast once she decided that, you know, let's go in there, let's just open it up, look at your pelvis, look at your internal organs, see what's going on. And um, so I got, I got the call because I was her um, healthcare proxy um from the doctor that that what they opened her up and it was so much cancer in her pelvis all of like the omentum just disintegrated and they couldn't even remove any because it was so diffuse it was on so many organs that they they even couldn't tell for sure what kind of cancer it was. I, I found out even after with the pathology, they really never did figure out um, for sure what kind of cancer it was. But um, it looked like ovarian, it acted like ovarian, didn't test like ovarian, so they didn't really know. So they closed her up, and that's when the the medical machine began with the chemo. And you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. And so she did as much chemo as she could. Um, she was better for two years, and um, you might notice that pattern a lot with people. They get better for a couple of years, and then the cancer comes back much stronger, mm -hmm. much faster, and often that is the, the time they don't recover. Um, yeah. So that's what happened with her. And so I've talked about this before. Um, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure I, that had to be, I'm sure that had to be so overwhelming though, when the second doctor took more time with her and actually decided to go in deeper and, and I mean, literally and explore things and see, Hey, what's actually going on here. I'm sure that had to be so overwhelming for your mom and for you and your whole family. And, 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 and even as bad as it was, though, the blessing in it was that finally somebody listened to her, right, validated what she was telling them, and helped her create a plan to investigate it. And so in this case, it was surgery. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, that what again wasn't her doctor, so she didn't continue to see her after that. No. Um, she went back to the other one, but um, no. and, you know, people have to do what what I guess people have to do what feels right to them. But a lot of times, that safer course of action, you know, I, I mean, it, it cost her her life. So um, taking risks is scary and making unpopular decisions, not just with your health, but making unpopular decisions with your health is scary. And, um, not everybody will want to do that. And so 
so you know i think that's one thing about about my book is that if if you don't want to do any of those things and then, then you know you gotta kind of respect people what they what they want and i don't want to force my opinion on anybody but all i want to do is let people know there is or even if, if they can get to the point of asking the question what if there is another way to treat whatever it is and if there was what might that look like for me right sure. um and and with me in in a few different cases I, that when that's happened to me, you know, even if you do decide to, to try a holistic therapy, you might not know how to start, where to start, mm -hmm. even fully understand what it is. So you might yeah. be thinking, oh, Reiki, Reiki. And you're like, I don't even know what Reiki is. Like, why is that word in my head? Um, right. But trust that if if you're listening to your, I, again, it, it can, whatever you call it, God, higher wisdom, the universe, um, that still small voice, right? If you're yeah. listening to that, it's never going to hear you wrong. Never. So you might not always understand what it's pushing, what direction it's pushing you in, and that might be too strong a word. Pulling, I think, is a better word. If you're feeling pulled towards something or drawn towards something, it's for a reason. And if you're feeling like, oh, <laughs> oh, and that could be about a practitioner, that could be about a medicine, you know, like, like you get the prescription, but you don't fill it. Yeah. Why? Something's telling you that it isn't going to be good for you. Sure. Okay. So. I, I loved in the book when, <laughs> is when you, speaking of Reiki, I loved in the book when you mentioned um, kind of the, um, you know, Etymological, you know, uh, etymology of that word and how it means like God's wisdom plus life force energy. And I thought that was really interesting to hear that because, again, I think sometimes there can be um, some unfounded fears around, yes. you know, almost like, well, what is this? This is different. Again, this is maybe more Eastern philosophy versus Western medicine philosophy. And um, do you have any advice as far as kind of? bringing those together as far as kind of sometimes the Eastern Western, the more um, almost spirit oriented versus the more medicine, 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 <laughs> yeah. doctors, you know? Yeah. I, um, I think that all, all can peacefully coexist. Okay. There are benefits to everything. There are downsides to everything. Um, with holistic healing measures though, um, generally, there really aren't any side effects. There really, really, most of the time, many, many of the therapeutic modalities cost nothing or very little. Um, they're not religions. So there is no, um, sometimes people think with Reiki that it's a religion or, or something like that. It isn't. Reiki is universal life force energy. And everything is energy. I mean, physics teaches us that, right? Quantum physics. The lamp is made up of vibrating particles. So are we. Um, and that's, you know, God is energy. The universe is energy. And I'm not a philosopher or anything. This is how I understand it. Um, but there's no, um, there's no battle there between faith and religion and, and Reiki energy or Chinese medicine herbs plants of the earth, you know, that God made. So it's not religion. Um, yes. You can be Catholic, you can be um, Hindu, you can, you know, whatever religion you want to follow, but that doesn't um, negate or or fight with, I don't know, I can't find the word I want here exactly, but they're well, not in opposition to each other. That's what I want to say. Sure. Well, and, and it's funny when you say that about the, the herbs and, and things that are from the earth. And I can remember I had a friend who said that once too, as far as, you know, crystals and rocks and things like that too, that she's like, you know, sometimes when you know, people with more traditional faith might question that and kind of say, what are you doing with the crystal thing or whatever? And she would go, you know, this is all part of God's create. Like, who do you think created rocks and crystals and and herbs and plants and you know all these things? So I th I felt like that was a really good, um, again, diffuser there to just yeah. go, hey, it, we're all good. It's okay. Like I'm not 
embracing the dark side or anything. Exactly. But I think there's that perception sometimes. And when you think about it, I mean, I don't know. Uh, when I was a little girl, I loved rocks. I would go to the beach. Yeah. Rocks and seashells and they probably feathers and things like that. Um, we felt drawn to those things. So, you know, why? It was it evil? <laughs> like, no, it's again, it's, like you said, it's part of the earth. It's part of nature. It's it's they have an energy that can draw us and can help us. So, this I was just telling somebody this today. Um, so, so I love rocks. I love crystals. And you know, somebody was asking me uh, today. I was at a, I was doing a book signing, and somebody was asking me about crystals, and she says, "Oh." Um, this person keeps trying to get me to come over and look at the crystals and talk to her about that. And I don't know about that. And, and I, so I said, you know, here, I, and I always have rocks with me. I'm like, see this? And she's like, yep. I'm like, this is a rock, <laughs> right? Oh, I had a different one, but, and then see this, like here, this is, this is a crystal. It's polished, but it's just a rock. So, and it has a, an energy like everything does. And so what can be wonderful about something like this is, you know, you just, and worry stones, right? Those have been around forever, but I don't like the word worry. So um, calming. Medi stone, meditation stone, maybe. Yeah, or calming, you know, you can you can really just sort of get, get more calm and centered by something as simple as that. And some people might do that with, with scents, like aromatherapy, essential oils. Um, plants, lavender, um, or I, you know, I can't pass a rosemary plant or a basil or without, you know, feeling it and inhaling the scent. And so yeah. all of those things, they cost nothing and they can really help support your health and lower your stress level. And stress can really, you know, that word is so overused, but it, it negative stress can really end up being the underpinning of a lot of health woes. Um, you know, from high blood pressure to all kinds of things. So um, anyway, I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I, and I think, um, I think that actually might help give me, you know, maybe some words to say too, that again, just if that's ever sort of called into question that as you <laughs> just saying those basic premises of, you know, everything's energy, everything is a part of, you know, God's creation. And again, why can, why is, you know, there's, it's not wrong to utilize yeah. those things. If those things are helpful to you. And, and, and they're here for us, you know, to utilize. So let's, let's use that. Well, and you, I, I was impressed, you know, when I, when I read through your book that you have so many different examples in your book of things that, that people can embrace that, uh, really seem to be, again, uh, you know, definitely a mind, body, spirit um, enriching, you know, kind of practices. I mean, you talk about everything from, you, know, you talk about clarity in the book and you talk about, um, you know, meditation, getting a meditation app, you talk about prayer, um, you talk about, you know, EFT, emotional uh, freedom technique and tapping for those who haven't, you know, heard of that, um, mind mapping and journaling, which again, I, I feel like even as a writer, I've always sort of underestimated that. I've never been a regular journaler. And yet I found more recently or at times when I was getting up and doing like the morning pages that like Julia Cameron um, would recommend from the artist's way that again, it really is almost like a brain dump and that these things will come out that, it, you know, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that, or oh, I got this to get done today, but it kind of frees you from just getting those things out on paper. You know, so you talk about that, you talk about um, Reiki and yoga and um, even like collage and vision boards, which again, I haven't done a lot with, but I'd like to, you know, explore more of that. You know, rocks and crystals, acupuncture, humor therapy, music therapy. Um, and it's funny, you also talk about like the one word focus for a year, you know, picking a one word to focus on. Um, I've actually done that this year, um, in the last couple of years. This year, my word has been action for 2018. And so again, that's been helping me sometimes to come back to 
get out of your head and don't just keep ruminating, ruminating, ruminating about things and not taking a step, take a step. <laughs> don't just well, sit and overthink things all the time. Exactly. And having that one word to come back to um, can really, it really can change your life. Um, it's not hard to remember one word, right? If, and if, and it, although I will say one year that I did it, I forgot like for half the year. <laughs> 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 <Not a> word. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to be oh, this year. What um, was my word again? <laughs> So now I do things like like one word, my year was breathe. So I have my breathe rock and I'll kind of surround myself with things that say my word on it and um, yeah. to remind myself. And um, what and is I'll, your word for this year? My word for this year is clarity. And I have on my desk, I have it spelled out in uh, different colored letters right across um, under my computer monitor so that it's always in front of me. Um, I did, I do a vision board every year around my birthday and I always put my word in it somewhere so I didn't used mm -hmm. to do that and um, I started thinking why wouldn't I put my word in my vision for my year right <laughs> so sure. but um yeah it's actually a spiritual practice and uh so there's a website myoneword.org and it's all one one word my one o n e word dot org, and um, really cool website. And there's a tab on the website that has a word finder. So if you're like, well, I don't know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of words. I don't know which one I would pick to focus on. Um, what I did one year, and and this was actually the, the year that that it really did create the most profound change in my life. The one year that I really didn't pick the word, it picked me, and it was one. That word finder. It was 2015, pretty sure. And so I already had a word. I was ready. And then I'm like, well, let me look at the word finder, you know, because it's kind of cool. And all these different words were popping up that other people had chosen. And and I saw the word brave. And I thought, oh, yeah. Nice. It's a, sound. It's a verb. <laughs> <laughs> like there's so many ways to use brave. And um, and I I would never have described myself as brave ever. Um, I was like a late bloomer spending most of my life trying to hide and blend in and don't anybody notice me. And um, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, not confident. And so the thought of being brave was kind of terrifying, right? Um, so, and I did so many things that year because um, I told everybody what my word was. And so whenever something big came up that in a million years I would never want to do, or I would argue myself out of doing, um, somebody would remind me, inevitably, somebody would remind me, but Karen, you're being brave this year. Like If you don't do it this year, when would you ever do it? And so... Wow. So... Good it really point. Have, yeah, something as simple as that. Again, spiritual practice, so simple, costs nothing. And and that, those were the kind, I mean, I included a lot of things in the book, a lot of different modalities, healing modalities, but there's dozens more, right? Um, and the more you explore, the more you'll find. And always follow what draws you, even if you don't know what it is, um, follow what draws you because that's your kind of inner compass letting you know what maybe your next step on your path might be that would be good for you and yeah. um, and and the ones that i included i wanted to put in things i either had experienced myself as um a receiver like like reiki um acupuncture um things like that or i had been a practitioner of like Reiki, um, or both. So I can give the perspective from both sides of, of the fence, kind of. You know, I know what it feels like to not know anything about it or what it is, but feel pulled towards it to learn more about it and receive it and then learn how to give it to others or teach others. And, um, sure. and I wanted to focus on things that were low cost or free. Yeah. I'm just going to do a quick recap, too, just since we've been talking um, for a while. So I just in case people, you know, watch this later and just give a quick recap. So I'm talking with Karen Creamer. She is the author of Honor Your Health, among other books. And um, we're just talking about um, some of her um, holistic um, health tips today. Oh, yeah, there we go. 
Yeah, I couldn't. I and I, I kept trying to look up what's your subtitle, Karen, on your book. Higher health: How to use holistic healing to create a life of clarity, comfort, and connection. Awesome. In there. And this book and this book comes out on July twenty sixth. July twenty sixth. Yeah, it's available for pre order now on um, Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. July twenty sixth, it will be live and live party streaming on Facebook if all goes well. Thursday, <laughs> 11, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time. Oh, nice. Yeah, what so, What are some of the things that are going on during your live stream? Uh, so we're going to have a live interview. And some of the questions I've been collecting from people, I've asked them to post them on my Facebook page or in my groups, On Your Health. There is a group, On Your Health, inspired by the book. Um, oh, nice. join. Please join. And yeah. And then also I'll be taking live questions from the online audience and then there'll be, there's uh, uh, some limited space for people to, you know, local to Southern Maine to come and participate live. And we're going to have, we have some great door prizes that we'll be drawing for the people um, who can come live, but we also have some prizes for the people online. So that is still evolving. Somebody actually just gave me something today, donated a prize um, for the in-person one, and it's a beautiful print, Christine Anizuski, who took my photo from my my book, and she All donated right. one of her prints, that it's beautiful, so. So um, yes, so Karen Creamer, Honor Your Health, the book comes out July 26th. I'm just recapping this just since we didn't didn't maybe get all the title and all that stuff out at the beginning. Yeah. And um, again, talking more about holistic um, health ideas and how you can really, um, you know, make the most of, of your health, mind, body, and spirit and how you can um, really yeah, embrace some different, different tools. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. And so you, and how to take back your power. How to take back your power, take responsibility for your health. And um, even when we were just talking about the one word focus for the year, I think it's so, like you said, so powerful just to have that one, you know, simple lens to come back. And as you're considering different options for your year, as you're considering different health options, different life options, yeah. that when you keep coming back to that one word, um, and, and when you mentioned about the um, the collage and the vision boards earlier, too, I, I'm a big Hay House radio listener, and I've heard a lot of interesting examples about how, again, I need to do this because I know this is a tool I'm not utilizing for myself, but just those amazing things happening with people where they put things on their vision board of, again, things they and again, I think sometimes people get caught up in thinking, oh, it's just a material thing. It's just selfish. I don't want it to be that. But again, I think it's more almost like the spirit of your life and what you want that to look and feel like. And and of course, it can include some material things because we're in the material world. But um, I had actually listened to um, a program with uh, Marilyn Aloria yesterday, and she was showing how she had had something on a vision board that um, it included like Adirondack chairs. Mm -hmm. She ended up moving to a location and ended up like someone bought her those chairs because they, and, and again, so then she looked back at the vision board and suddenly went, oh my gosh, it's the chairs like that are on this deck that I had. And again, she's like, I forgot that that was in there. Right. And that's one of the things about collage and vision boards is, um, like you said, you start argue, you talk yourself out of what you want, right? So, so don't do that. And uh, making collage and using images to create a vision for your life helps kind of pull you out of that left brain monkey mind that's that you know feed it a banana yeah. and, <laughs> and use your right brain to create you know a a view of of what you want and everything is in the world for us to have. It's no wrong thing, right? There's plenty for everyone and what you feel drawn to, um, you know, and, and don't don't think about it. You're looking at pictures, you're looking through magazines. Oh, it caught my eye. You don't have to know why. You don't have to know why. Good you point. Caught, you don't have to know how. Oh, I'm never gonna be able to get that car. Why would you argue against the thing you want? And we're only talking about a picture of it glued on a board, right? right. So that's right. one of 
most most useful things for me about um, creating collages and vision boards is it really made me aware of how often I do that. Um, that I start throwing up all these barriers and obstacles against yeah. the, the thing that I want. And so how amazing might our lives be if we started putting all that energy towards allowing in what we really want, mm -hmm. right? Something better instead of arguing against it, it you know? And, and I think embracing, um, I, like, I would love to do the collage activity with my kids as an example. I think that that would be so fun to do with them. And again, I think so many times as adults, we get away from that sense of play. Like say kids make collages of different things, whether it's animals they like or places they want to go or, you know, whatever it is. And so I think, again, as adults, so many times we get away from that and we feel like, oh, we can't play or I'm too serious <laughs> to do that. I'm not going to get out, you know, magazine, you know, I'm not going to cut out pictures and glue them. And, oh, that's kind of silly. And it's like. Well, well, you know, we're all we're all creators and, you know, so many people were told when they were growing up that they can't draw, you know, and then they never did another work, another artistic thing <laughs> in their lives. And yeah. because one person's opinion, like one teacher's opinion, maybe she was having a bad day or who knows. <laughs> and it yeah. and it's going to turn you off from art for the rest of your life, right? Um, yeah. what other people think of us is none of our concern. And I got that from Jack Canfield way back. I don't know where he got it, but. Yeah. Um, so collage allows you to be artistic. Anyone can do it. Like you said, children can do it. You know, a glue stick, images, and, and even this can be free because, or next to free. Um, I have a method, a way that I've adapted to do them now. Um, which would be a whole nother talk, but do you want to see one of my vision boards? Yes, please. Yeah. And I, well, and I was going to ask too, I, I was figuring you may have had your own examples too, as far as um, not only the vision boards, but maybe like if you've had some interesting things happen in your life around that after having made, made these vision yeah. boards, like I'd love to hear about that. So this is one thing it's, it's, it's um, again, sort of everything is energy and, the images are, but written words are, and you talked about brain dumps and like mind maps or written things. And I'll just tell you about this because it was what I was thinking when we were talking. And, about. and you can show your vision board first if you'd like, if you don't want okay. me to. <laughs> so, um, so I got this binder at the dollar store. Okay. I actually have a course on Thinkific about how, about the way I do this because I, I love the way I do it. It's evolved over the years. Um, filling a big, po like a lot of times people think vision board, they think a big poster board and that's intimidating. That's a lot of white space <laughs> or blue. I have, okay. I have to just say, I have a poster board in my mudroom yep. that I haven't used yet. And I think it's kind of for that very reason of it's blue, actually it's not yeah. white, but still it's kind of like, what do I do? Right. <laughs> and where do I hang it up when I'm done? <laughs> that's right. And, and actually it's funny because I have a piece of blue, um, poster board I bought to do a vision board and it's behind my my couch here. I never did it. Oh my so, gosh. <laughs> How funny. <laughs> so I started doing um, letter size paper and I used to use regular copy paper just right out of the copier. Now I use cardstock, which you can get at Walmart. You can get a big pack of it. It doesn't cost that much money. Um, yeah. And I've gotten colors, but I usually just use white. I find I always kind of come back to white, like the blank slate. Yeah. But, okay. And, and I started doing them like while I was, I'm like, oh, I can't just cut and paste, right? Because that's a waste of time. I should, be do, I should be doing this or this or this. So, um, but you know what? We also should be taking time to rest and relax. And so I like to watch Hallmark movies. I don't know um, if any of you people do, but I'm sure there's something you like to watch on TV. Um, but so like on a Sunday, if I was watching a Hallmark movie, I would just get out what I was going to use and, um, and just rip images and you can do this in stages. Maybe you just get the images first. And I started putting them in like a big Ziploc bag. So I had one for words and one for pictures. Yeah. And some people tell you can't put words on your vision board. You know, you can put whatever you want. It's your board. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
and that's you know another thing about holistic therapies in general you know don't get hung up on the the way to do it or you have to do it this way learn a method and then adapt it to to yourself so that's what i did with vision boards so let me um i'll show you the one i did uh, this year on my birthday um so i turned 55 like i said this was a big year for me because it was the last year of my mother's life with her 50 yeah. year um so so i made it on cardstock and i slipped them into paste protectors and i put them in this binder so i can go back i'm not showing you this one but like i can go back and see all these ones that i've done right and i can look at pro oh make sure you put your year on your vision board um <laughs> i can look back at prior years and really see um uh you know what how it has influenced my life okay interesting so i love doing one on my birthday so this i'll take it out because i have a feeling there will be glare but this was this year's so one thing i learned is it can be really powerful to put a picture of yourself that you love in the middle of your vision board um this is the first year i did that i only just heard that from i think Christine Kane teaches about vision boards. So I said, you know what? I'm going to try it, see what happens. And um, so I just, you know, I just started putting things on and things I love and things that make me happy. Or, um, you know, I love owls. They're, I feel like they speak to me lately in my life. So I have an owl on there. And, you know, I love Danny Goki. I love Christian music. Um, I'm a mom. I'm a writer. Here's my keyboard. I, th these are things that are important to me, my, my roles in life, and also things I love to do and things I want to be surrounded by. Um, I'm a holistic nurse. I love books. I love dancing. <laughs> so um, crystals, I have a little crystal corner down there. Um, when you so, when you've looked back, when you've looked back at previous years and you've kind of seen you know, some of the evolution of that. Yes. Um, are there interesting patterns that you've noticed or things where you can kind of see how something maybe guided you towards something or like, oh, hey, I put this on there and then that ended up happening that year or? So one thing was my car. Um, I wanted a RAV4, I'd always wanted a RAV4 and every year I didn't get one. And I had literally, I think six Corollas in a row. <laughs> <laughs> ever drove and i said i'm going to put a blue corolla on i mean a blue rav4 on my board and um it wasn't the exact one that i put on my board but um but now i do drive a rav4 which uh, you know that is huge for me that is a huge change sure but another thing i wanted to say is so uh years ago uh, my husband and i were just kind of daydreaming and oh you know if we if if we moved to Maine, which we have have done, what would we want our our house to be like? And so we just got a legal pad and just started listing this and this and these are all the things we would want. And then, um, like so many things, that got put away somewhere and forgot about, forgot about. And um, and then after we moved, I don't even know how long it was after we moved, but I was going through, you know, I have piles of things. <laughs> So going through my piles, me too. I found the legal pad, and I was like, "Oh, look at this!" You know, our dream home, I think, was the heading on it. And I started reading it, and I, you know, you get that tingly feeling. So I mm -hmm. it, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Every, I think there were twenty-five things on that page, and every single one of them was present in our new home, except for one. Um, because it said like we wanted to be on the ocean, but it was still on 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 a river, <laughs> so it wasn't the ocean. But um, you know, we're near a body of water. Water. <laughs> so wow. Um, so well, it, working for you know, they say you have to have that vision board where you can see it, and you know, maybe I don't know. You'll have to experiment with that because I think once the energy goes into it the feeling goes into it, it's going to work for you. And so I keep mine in my dollar store binder and I know it's here. And I, sometimes I take it out and hang it up. Um, I often do that, but that's another thing about a giant vision board, right? Maybe you don't want everyone in your family to see what's on your vision board. Right, um, right. You make one a size like this 
you know, it's discreet. So you can hang it up, but you can tuck it away too. If you know, if I like that private. Yeah. Um, I like that a lot. And, and again, I think you make a good point too, that again, it's almost, it's about that act of creation. It's about that act of putting the, you know, whether you're writing or whether you're posting images or, or doing both. Um, but it's kind of interesting. I think I tried an app. I downloaded like a vision board app, but I found that it didn't, it didn't quite work for me as well because, and again, and I had some things change in my life. So then I kind of needed to go back and delete, you know, some pictures and things too. But it was almost like there were just like nine slots for pictures and it didn't seem to have the power for me. And maybe it's just because it's electronic and not physical. Yeah. Um, but I. You're not using all your senses in the same way. Yeah, but I, I know what you mean. And I think I've heard people say that before too, that again, like you say, it doesn't necessarily have to be like posted above your desk or your living room wall or anything like that, that you can do this. But like you say, it's more setting that intention that then it's like you yes. set the intention, you yes. create, you like you say, you're trying to, you know, attract these good things into your life. And so then, and I think like you say, so many times we get caught up and I know I get caught up in the how. Well, how am I going to get from point A to point Q? Yeah. And it just seems so impossible. But again, it kind of gets you out of that feeling too of like, yeah. I don't have to worry about the how. I'm just going to trust that I'm going to put this out there and we'll see what happens. Exactly. This or something better. And you don't know, you know, the power that's going to have or what it might bring your way. And um, and you can always revise, <laughs> you know, like if you say, oh, you know what? I thought I wanted this. I didn't get it yet, but you know what? I really don't want it anymore. So maybe that's why I didn't. And so it's not going to yeah. be on your board the following year or, you know, whatever. So. Well, and I, I also love just talking about Maine for a minute. I know I can just tell from your writing and whenever you speak how much love you have for Maine, where you live and the ocean. And um, I was really struck by that example in your book when you seem to talk about, again, that kind of that concept of like, let's create a life that I don't need a vacation from. Like, let's, you know, because you had given that example that you used to live in Massachusetts mm -hmm. um, and that you and your husband and, and family would go to Maine like every year on vacation. And so, and then what happened after that? So, so we thought, you know, well, when we retire, we'll move to Maine. So we started thinking that that was going to be the plan and, and then after, you know, more time went by, we're going back and forth. Um, you know, there's there's times, there's moments in your life when you feel like things sort of screech to a halt and, and they're just like forever in your mind, like captured that moment. We're driving home and I turned to my husband, Bill, and I said, you know, I really wish we were staying here. And he said, I do too. And I <laughs> said, what if... And again, that what if, right? What if we moved here now instead of waiting until we retire? What if we moved here now and we're like, <laughs> why not, right? Yeah. Like, told me. And so it took a couple of years, and, and I'm not going to say I didn't have white knuckled moments because I sure did, but. Um, well, I, I love in the book, Karen, how you also describe that as soon as you let yourself ask that what if question, that the more logical part of you immediately went, nope, here's all the reasons we can't do that. Here's exactly. all the reasons it won't work. I don't know the how, all that. And so I love that example because, again, I think it's so real that, again, we all sort of ask those what if questions. And then and then it's like you kind of get scared and then you go, but this, it, 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 it work. there's no way. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to entertain that. I'm not going to get excited about it. This is going to happen. So how did you overcome that? Yeah. How? Well, I I just started thinking. Okay. Um. So I I had that little mini meltdown right about all one. <laughs> um. And I will say I think you know my husband was a little more involved than me at that point in our lives. Um. Because <laughs> he he after I asked that he he a little ahead of me was like well yeah like let's do that <laughs> and <laughs> so it became my job to think of ways to make it happen. And so, you know, we can't, we can't, what if we could, what might that look like? Well, I might call this person and ask this question, or I might, you know, so once you start a lot, allowing yourself to believe you can have it, things shift. 
and you start to think of ways that you can take steps towards that goal that maybe you wouldn't have seen before because you were too busy talking yourself out of it <laughs> that you couldn't have it. Um, I really do think that anything we can think of, I don't know where I heard this. I, I, I have a lot of teachers like, oh, in the world okay sure if it if it's in your if you can have the thought whatever it is then it's already in your field or you wouldn't be able to have the thought it's in your field and also what you're seeking is seeking you and that's mm -hmm. a really good and i know that yeah, I remember seeing, I think I've seen you post that one lately too, or, and I, I know I've seen that and I was just like, ooh, yeah, that's powerful. And, and I really, I really have come to believe that that's true. And so um, once you set, set the course, things start lining up that you might never have believed, you know, how, how did this happen? <laughs> Yeah. You know, how did this person decide that they were going to help me? Or just so many things, you know, can align once you let yourself believe that you're you're worthy and you can have you can have what you want. I a friend of mine kind of used to say that as like um your dreams are God's dreams was how she sort of put that I to me. That. And I thought that was really cool too, because again, it was almost like, you know, you're you're not being given this desire, again, as long as it's, you know, a positive, you know, desire and not hurting anyone else or anything like that. But she's like, you know, you're not being given that for no reason. Like, you know, the, the dreams you have for your life and the best vision and, and version of your life and yourself, you know, God wants those things for you too. That's, that's who's implanting in so those dreams in you. And I thought that was really a cool concept too. And yeah, I think she said that to me back at a time when I was, you know, I was really wanting a baby, you know, in my life and I was not sure how that was going to happen for me. And so it was just kind of like, but yeah, it was very much that kind of similar advice of like, you're being given this dream for a reason and create the space for that and sort of acting as if, you know, yes. by a little baby stuff and imagine getting it out and using it and that, you know, and, and again, and I, that did, you know, happen for me and I am very blessed with my, my two kids. So, but, um, that's awesome. How I have to ask, so how long was it between the time that you and your husband asked the, what if, what if we moved to Maine, but between then and when you actually were able to make that move, how long was that? About two years, two years. And it really came down to more of, um, we were, trying to to time it because of the ages of our children should should we allow one to start kindergarten and then pull her out and move or should we disrupt the older one in the middle of middle school and pull him out and move and so we had him go we went back and forth on that so that's why it took it took that long but sure but you know that's a pretty short time frame yeah, in the grand scheme was, when you think about it, because I was waiting, I was waiting for you to say, oh, it was, you know, five years, seven years or something like that. So yeah, no, that's too. great. Yeah. And and it seems like, again, that where you are, you seem to feel very aligned with that, that that's aligned with you and you're very happy. When I first moved to Maine, I had this thought and it was so clear that I am more myself in Maine than I ever was in Massachusetts and I don't know what it means, but it was very loud and clear and um, and it's true. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, I, I love it here. I really do. That's really interesting. Yeah. Do you have do you have any <laughs> do you have any um, family connections there that might maybe help explain that? If any like ancestors living there or anything like that? No, not that you know that's interesting. But yeah. Very <laughs> cool. You always used to vacation here. <laughs> that's all yeah. Me. yeah. Well, I know that um, I'm trying to think. Is is there anything kind of that you that you'd like to talk about that we haven't talked about yet? I just want to give you some space if you if there's certain things about the book or about what you're doing right now. Or, well, what I'm I'm in the middle of right now is the 10 day countdown to the book launch. So pretty much everything I'm doing is kind of revolving around that. Sure. Um, so, and I'm trying to make it fun. I'm, I'm having fun. I, I hope that people have, en have enjoyed our talk today. 
And if anybody has questions, I, I don't, um, I can't really see from my view. I don't know if you can, Jane, but if anybody has any questions, they could, they could post them and either, you know, if we see them, we can answer them or, you know, after the fact, we can go back and look and see. Sure. Um, yeah, we've, we've had a couple of viewers pop, pop on and off while we've been talking. I don't know if maybe this is, maybe we're just not catching people at a good time, but hopefully we can share this, you know, after the fact and maybe get some, oh, yeah. get some more comments and feedback. But um, yeah. Um, so, Let's see. Um, I know that one thing I was really um, I was really struck by in your book was um, so of course you know talking about your mom and talking about the influence that that had on on you as far as you know your mom's illness and and how that was handled and and her passing. Um, so you had talked about how your mom passed on on Leap Day, um, February 29th, ninth, nineteen ninety six. And um, you said, you know, that you could see that in your mom because then it's like, oh, well, you know, we'd only have to be sad once every four years and yeah. have to sort of relive that date. And um, just when you said, you know, maybe for the first time in her life, she put on her own oxygen mask first. And that just brought me to tears. I mean, it was just like, oh, my gosh, that's so that's so powerful. And again, and I think such a testament to moms that of course you know you don't want your children to be sad and and all that but you just said a lot of really um, powerful things around that Thank you, Jenny. well um and i hope you know as as difficult as as that time was and everything that she went through um you know i think that if if it turns into something good in that it helps sort of light the way for others to know that there, you know, again, there is another way. Um, there's another way to approach it. You can, you can be brave. <laughs> you can, you can take back your power and you can um, be the boss of you. You're the expert on you. See what feels right to you and make your decisions, you know, from that place of, you um, kind of, you know, from that heart-centered place where um, doing what feels like the right thing, even if it's the unpopular thing, putting yourself first. And, um, sure. and you know, you can't give from an empty well, right, as they say. So you have to, you have to give yourself that time. And so anyway, so that's one, one thing. And um, just in general, I, I think that I think that because the medical industry has become such big business and it can be so intimidating that anything that allows you to be in charge, to kind of be driving the car instead of being the passenger um, is a good thing. And so anything that makes you feel empowered is going to make you feel more confident. Um, that's my thinking. And the holistic health measures that we have been talking about, I put my book over there when I got the vision board. Um, uh, you know, nothing's right for everybody, but I hope it'll get you thinking. And if there is something you've been sort of toying with the idea of maybe even becoming a practitioner of, uh, not only experiencing as, as a client, um, that you'll pursue that. <laughs> and so, um, and take good care of yourselves that, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. That sounds great. And uh, I really, I just appreciate your time and getting that weird echo again. I'm not sure why, but um, I, I also love, though, how I know that, like you said, this is a really powerful time for you as you were writing and releasing this book to make that connection with your mom's age and, and your age that it's like, well, now I'm the age that my mom was when she passed or now I'm past the age that my mom was when she passed. And can you, can you, I love that, that, um, comment that you share in the book that it's almost like, well, you know, of course, when bad things happen, you know, and we lose people that we love, we always, you know, question why. And I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit, but I felt like you came up with a really interesting insight there. So I would say there are times where I feel more despair about it than others. Um, grief is like that, as I'm sure everybody knows. And um, so one time I was feeling you know, particularly upset and, and sad and, you know, thinking about, about how, 
her life, her whole life, and how what she went through and how it ended and how how terrible it was. Um, and I was talking to my friend Barbara, and and she said, and I, you know, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but it was really one of the most profound statements I think I've ever heard, and it was that that she had to live the life that she lived so that I could live the life that I'm living. And at first it just sort of, you know, I listened and then, and then I heard it. Mm. And I saw how true that is, not just with my mother, but also with my father, how true it is that I would not be doing what I'm doing now had they not lived the lives that they lived. And so, um, you know, I still wish that they had a better, better time here on earth, the two of them while they were here. I feel like they had um, just very difficult and often, um, you know, really terrible things um, happen to them. And um, they don't make, you know, how do I make sense of it? I couldn't make sense of it. And then that kind of, oh, you know, I, I don't understand it really but I understand that and someday I'll understand it all. Sure. Absolutely. Well, and I, I certainly can relate to that as well because, um, you know, I've just, I've gone through some difficult things recently and, and again, it helps to understand though, that like you say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the person I am. I wouldn't be becoming the person I'm becoming if those things hadn't happened. And so, but yeah, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry, but I just, I love that example. And like I said, it made me cry when I was reading your book too, because it really brings that purpose home. And like you say, you know, it's unfortunate that things weren't able to, you know, go on further for your parents, for them to have longer lives. But maybe because of those experiences, then you're going to help more people. You're going to help yourself and and others. And that again, that can sort of be you know their legacy too. Is that they're going to help a lot of people without knowing it. You know, through you and through that being so yeah, and through that being so so personal and so passionate for you that it's like you know I don't want other people to go through this. And if they do have a doctor that is rushing through things yeah. with them, because again, doctors are rushed and they don't always take the time, you know, with us that we, that we really need, that if somebody is just sort of shooting from the hip, that then maybe you can either look into things further yourself, you can choose a different practitioner, you can explore some of these, um, you know, alternative medicine options and alternative healing and, you know, that you can um, explore those things. Yeah, empower yourself. And so go say say the name of your book again, so just then hold it up just so then that way we know if you on your, health, on your health, how to use holistic healing to create a life of clarity, there's my word, comfort and connection. Yeah, I, I yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that. That's excellent. So I just have to tell you my first book, One Brave Thing, um, Brave, that was the word that the year before brave and that made oh, it right. the title of this book um the second book is different so what if Phoebe stays with steven don't have my word in there but that was kind of a different kind of a book so but i just sure. realized while we're talking that two of my three books my one word for the year made it into the titles <laughs> so yeah. see the influence that your word can have like in ways you don't even realize so um well and i i also I also think it's so impressive that you're someone who's actually done um, the the NaNoWriMo for anyone who's um, familiar with that, the National um, Novel Writing Month, and that that has actually propelled you toward getting your books written. Yeah, yeah. Structure is your friend or my friend anyway um, with book with writing books because um, you know the whole rest of the year, it, you're, my, at least for me, writing takes the back seat. You know, everything else comes ahead of it. But every year in November, <laughs> the writing comes first. So thousands of brave souls commit to writing uh, at least 50,000 words in 30 days. And that's National Novel Writing Month. It's free. Um, NanoRimo.org is the website to sign up. And you're part of a community. And we talked earlier about creating a community of you know like-minded individuals um, that are on board with what you're doing and are doing the same thing themselves. So with NanoRimo, it's writing. 
And um, yeah, you can, at the end of 30 days, you can have your first draft of your book in your hand. So yeah, wow. I would recommend it. It works for me. I've done it for like seven years now. And I have more books written that I'm going to publish wow. a book every year. So <laughs> that is so awesome. And I so, I so admire your dedication on that because I've, I've signed, I admit, I've signed up a couple of times, but I've never really committed to doing that hard work. Or I tried to commit, but then I you just... You have to tell everybody <laughs> that you're doing it. You have to tell everybody. And then you have to say, you're not doing the dishes, you're not doing the laundry, until <laughs> after you write your 2,000 words that day, or whatever your word count goal is. Everything sure. else comes after. It's only a month. It's one month. You can do anything for 30 days. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm excelling on that in some areas, but I know that the writing is the one that I really need to, again, it's like, okay, so if you say you want to write this book or these books, you got to start working on it. You got to commit, you know, in smaller chunks, you got to commit every day to be doing something. Or at least for one month out of the year, <laughs> every day, for one month, and then you have the whole winter to edit it, you know, and to Get well, I, I love that that blitz method works for you because, again, I've always tended to be that sort of blitz method worker that I'm the person writing the paper the night before. <laughs> uh, that was me all through college. That was me. Yeah. Oh, thank God I'm not alone or it's not just me because sometimes I feel like, oh, man, like I'm the only one that's still like other people have outgrown this and I still haven't. And I'm still like that sort of last minute worker that... <laughs> But I, I have a supervisor right now at my day job who has actually said, like, but, you know, like, your work style is your work style. And, like, Embrace you're it. probably not going to change that a lot at this point. So maybe that might work better for me than I think if I simply, you know, commit to that and then and then set that, you know, that word limit. Well, no. Right? Right. Well, is there is there anything else, Karen, that you'd like to share? Anything you'd like to direct people to, or any, um, you know, um, anything else that you'd like to summarize about the book? Or, um, you know what? You can go to my website, KarenKreamer.com, and everything's on my website. I have some online courses that I teach there listed there. I do the holistic practitioner interviews, um, inspired by this book. I interview one holistic practitioner every month about their practice and how they were called to it and how they, um, uh, you know, how they deliver it or whatever. So um, in the Brave interviews, which you were in the Brave interview series, um, Jane, and so one woman a month tells something brave they've done inspired by my first book, One Brave Thing, and that's all, everything's in one place now, so I'm excited about that. KarenGreener.com, I don't have all these other websites, it's all in one place. Um, and also the events I'm doing, all the information about my books is there. And um, so if you're interested, you can look at all of that. And then I'm the met, uh, Metaphysical Nurse on Facebook. So you can like my page. I'm also Karen Creamer on Facebook. That's my page. Uh, on Your Health is the group inspired by the new book, Join. Please love to have you. And uh, One Brave Thing is the group inspired by the first book, One Brave Thing. So um, lots of ways to connect with me. So I hope that some of you, if you haven't already, I hope you will. And That's hope awesome. You will. July 26th, available globally. Yes. So yeah, check out Karen uh, Karen Creamer's book, Honor Your Health. It is. It drops on Amazon July 26th. And I I can speak from reading it that it's, it's an excellent book. It has a lot of really good tips. And again, some things very simple health things that you wouldn't you necessarily even right think of. So. Yeah. You can apply right away for free and see see how they work for you, right? So Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you again so much, Karen, for your time. And um, I just so appreciate, you know, that we connected last year at the Igniting Souls Conference. And I'll just make a quick plug for that, too. Okay. So the Igniting Souls um, Conference is coming up um, in October, starting October 25th. And... Um, if you have any interest in, you know, writing, speaking, coaching, or even just getting inspired about your life and um, trying to make the most of that, um, I would just highly recommend it. Um, Karen and I actually, I think my cat is coming over it's to visit. Really um, <laughs> Here's Emma. I was kind of knocking into the into the computer screen there. But um, anyway, but Karen and I actually met at that event last year, and um, we we both, I think, were really inspired. It was definitely, for me, like a, a life-changing experience. I feel like I've sort of lived my life differently after going to that conference. I agree. 
And so, just the, the connections and the friends and um, the experiences that have come out of that have just been, you know, I, I think I've used the word, the phrase life changing a lot here today, but, you know, it really has been an incredible year and Igniting Souls was, was a big part of it last year and I'm looking forward to it this year. Yeah, and they've, they've added some new elements this year too with the Author Academy Awards yeah. and um, some other benefits for authors. And um, if you get the VIP, you get like headshots and um, admission to certain um, kind of specialty events with some of the presenters. So I think there's a lot of exciting things there. Um, so I, if, again, if you Google Igniting Souls Conference, I'm sure that'll that'll come up. I can also maybe share the link in the yeah, in the comments time. later too. Um, but uh, Karen and I will both be there again this yeah. year. Um, we'll get to reconnect with each other more and um, also with the other participants. And again, I just so inspiring. So many people trying to sort of get on the right path with their lives and. Um, really go after their dreams, become a soul on fire, as uh, Carrie Overbrunner says. So anyway, well, thank you again, Karen, so much. This is such a great interview, and I hope that it really helps promote your book. Oh, thank you, and I hope that it really helps people take back their power. Sounds good. Well, thank you again so much. So nice to talk with you, and take care, and we'll see you soon. Okay, bye. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Bye. Thank you.